Hey, this is Levi, and I want to thank you so much for joining us for this message from Fresh Life Church. It's summertime, and we know you're hitting that hammock, you're out in the canoe, you're lying by the lake, and you're jumping on that airplane for that last minute trip. And one of the things you got to figure out is what book are you going to throw in that beach bag? What book are you going to bring with you? Well, we're here to help because we've picked some amazing books and invited the authors to come out to Fresh Life and to speak, giving us kind of a a book report on the message that lit them up so much that they needed to write this book out. And uh, so I hope you'll enjoy this message from a few of my friends speaking, uh, helping us figure out our summer reading. What's up, Fresh Life Church? All right, so good to be here. Welcome uh, all the locations, anybody watching online. First time in northern Montana. Huge thanks to uh, Levi and Jenny for bringing me out here, uh, allowing me to bring my four-year-old son. He is so excited to see the mountains and go fishing, and uh, I'm just I'm honored to be able to share a little bit about my story today. Uh, okay, I guess you guys can sit down. <laughs> so I'm going to start at the beginning. I was born in Philadelphia in a middle-class family, and when I was four, my whole family almost died. We moved into this drab gray house uh, to get closer to my dad's, uh, my dad's new job. He wanted to lessen his commute. And what we didn't know when we moved in this house in the dead of winter was that there was a carbon monoxide gas leak. And we all start to get sick. On New Year's Day, my mom walks across uh, my parents' bedroom and she collapses unconscious. And we take her to the hospital, and after a long series of blood tests, the doctors find massive amounts of carbon monoxide in her bloodstream. Now, this was before they had invented the carbon monoxide detector, which I hope you all have in your homes. Uh, So what had happened, really, was her her immune system was irreparably destroyed. My dad and I bounced back, because we were only sleeping in the house. But I watched my mom, well, I actually watched my dad first rip out the heater. He was the one that found the crack, and he rips it out, he throws it uh, on the curb. And I watched my mom go from this healthy, vibrant wife and mother, I mean, she could do no wrong, and she, in a moment, becomes an invalid. She would wear these charcoal masks that you see here. She would uh, walk around with oxygen tanks. Perfume would make her sick. Soap would make her sick. Uh, The ink from books would make her sick. And her life was just, uh, it was over. Uh, Her health was over at this point. So at four, I watched my parents, uh, they don't sue the gas company. My parents had a deep and authentic uh, Christian faith and they just didn't want to become bitter. They believed that God would provide for mom. And I I went into a caregiver role at a really early age. I'm now doing the cooking, I'm now doing the cleaning, I'm helping to take care of mom. And I grew up in the church. I was the kid that played piano every Sunday. As you can see here, my parents used an actual cereal bowl to cut my hair for many years. And uh, I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, I didn't have sex, I didn't cuss, you know, I, I took care of my mom. And then all that changed at 18. And at 18, uh, I had this moment where I just woke up and said, now it's my turn. Now it's time to live. Now it's time to look out for number one. Now it's time to, to break the rules. And I discovered New York City was only about an hour and a half away. And I grew my hair down to my shoulders. I joined a band. Uh, and I went in search of, of fame and fortune. You know, my, my dream was that our band would be opening up for you 2 in sold-out amphitheaters around the world. I mean, this would happen within a short order of months. <laughs> the band broke up in a couple months. Uh, we all hated each other and we couldn't get along. But I learned that there was this amazing job in New York City. If you wanted to rebel, you could rebel in style as a nightclub promoter. Wow. And all you had to do was get the right people inside the right clubs. And if you did that, you could charge people ridiculous amounts for booze. I mean, you could sell a bottle of champagne for $1,000 that cost you $35. So I thought this was amazing. I mean, I'm 18. I'm not even allowed to work in clubs yet. And I'm running around New York City, you know, spraying champagne from uh, from the DJ booth and and getting all the right people to queue outside the clubs. I spend the next 10 years in New York working at 40 different nightclubs. And here is a picture taken of me 10 years later in a VIP room. And what's so sad about this picture, as you'll see, I am trying to show off a Rolex watch to a club photographer I've never met. It was important to me that he saw I owned an expensive watch. Now, on the outside, my life looked great. 
the bottle that you see in this picture, I was getting paid $4,000 a month by Bacardi just to drink Bacardi in public. And Budweiser paid us another $4,000 a month just to drink Bud in public. So I'm like, I have the life. I mean, not only am I drinking for free, I am getting paid to be seen drinking, okay? This was around 10 o'clock at night. This was around two in the morning, okay? This was around noon the next day. So on the outside, things looked great, but on the inside, I was rotting. I had become this hedonist. I had become this dark, angry, enraged, bitter person that was addicted to cigarettes and alcohol and gambling and pornography and strip clubs and cocaine and ecstasy, MDMA, and pretty much anything short of mainlining heroin at this point, you know, I have, I have taken into my life. Now, check in with my parents. You can imagine their chagrin. I mean, 10 years, like, they have been praying for their prodigal to come home. I mean, they have little old ladies locked up in prayer closets wearing <laughs> holes into the carpet, you know, with their knees, praying for, for me to come home. And one day at 28 years old, uh, I, I have this moment and I realize that, that I am morally bankrupt. I am spiritually bankrupt. I, I am emotionally bankrupt. I am the worst person that I know. And, and I just started thinking about legacy. You know, I, I, if I continue down this path, my tombstone might read, here lies a man who's gotten a million people wasted. And nobody wants that on their tombstone. My dad had sent me a book by A.W. Tozer called The Pursuit of God. And I start reading this hungover in Punta del Esta, South America, with all these beautiful people. And, and you know, I, I, I'm, I'm always wary of churchy words like convicted, but I think that's, that's what happened. I was faced with the opposite intention of my life. I was reading a book about a man who was pursuing uh, virtuousness. He was pursuing humility. He wanted to be childlike. He wanted to know God. And here, you know, I am pursuing the opposite of that. I, I remember reading the Bible again. I came across a verse in James that said, true religion is to look after widows and orphans in their distress and to keep from being polluted by the world. I was 0 for 2. Okay, I mean, not only had I done nothing for the poor or a widow and orphan, I literally polluted people for a living. And I, and I realized I needed to make a change. And it took about six months and a bunch of circumstances, which, which I wrote about in, in, in this book. But six months later, I make a radical life change. I decide I am going to sell everything I own. I'm going to go serve God and the poor for one year. I'm going to tithe one of the 10 years that I've wasted and see where that takes me. So I... My, my big idea was to apply to humanitarian organizations, right? I, I'd heard of the Red Cross before. I'd heard of World Vision and Save the Children. So I put in my applications to volunteer, and none of these organizations will take me, not one, right? I'm a nightclub promoter. These are serious humanitarian aid workers. How would I in any way be useful to them? Finally, thank God, one organization says if I pay them $500 a month and go live in post-war Liberia, now, this is a country I had never even heard of before. Then I can volunteer. So I'm like, great, this is opposite. Go broke, go to the poorest country in the world. I'm like, here are my credit card details. When do you start? And they said, in three weeks. So I dust off a, a journalism degree that I'd gotten at NYU and I'd never used because I was working the clubs. And I go into Liberia at 28 years old, followed by 14,000 United Nations peacekeepers. And I join a humanitarian medical mission. This was my new home. It was a 522-foot hospital ship. And it was an amazing organization. Uh, the, a simple idea, bring the best doctors and surgeons on a hospital ship to people who can't afford access to medical care. So they would sail up and down the coast and they would operate on people who, didn't, who couldn't afford it. So I go all in, I have this moment and I'm kind of wrestling with God. I just realized that I would have to walk away from the smoking and the drinking and the drugs and the gambling and the porn and all this stuff. And if I admit it, I went out with a bang the night before I joined the ship. I smoked three packs of cigarettes. I had eight or nine beers. The legend is of this organization, I turn up reeking of alcohol to surrender my passport and, and you know, say, hey, I'm here for duty. But that was it. I never smoked again and I never touched drugs again and I never gambled again and I was... I wound up being celibate for five and a half years until my wedding night. I just walked away from everything because I, I thought that if I did that, maybe it would allow a new story to unfold. Maybe I could actually start life over 
at 28 or come home. So I find this country to be a disaster. I mean, there's no electricity in Liberia. There's no running water. There's no sewage. There's no mail system. People are living in bombed out apartment buildings. Uh, They're living in houses that were once beautiful but had been completely destroyed by a war. And our job was going to be to look for people who, who were sick and needed help. Just to give you a perspective, Liberia had one doctor for every 50,000 citizens. Okay, here in America, we have a doctor for every 180 of us. So when you got sick in this country, you were, you were out of luck. And, and we specialized in conditions I'd never seen before, flesh-eating disease and giant facial tumors and people who had been burned during the war. And we would post these flyers around the country and we'd say, if you've got one of these conditions, turn up and our doctors will try to see you. And my third day on the mission, I knew that we had 1,500 available surgery slots. We could bring 1,500 people onto the ship and heal them. And as I turned the corner of the football stadium, the the soccer stadium that the government had given us to triage patients, I took this photo of over 5,000 people. Over 5,000 people came for 1,500 slots. And this hit me so hard. I realized we're going to turn over 3,000 people. We're going to send them home with no hope, with no help. I later learned many of these people had walked for more than a month just in the hope of seeing a doctor. First kid that I photographed was this little boy named Alfred. And he was suffocating to death on his own face with a benign tumor. His mom says, four years ago, this is what my son looked like. He was completely fine. He was a healthy 10-year-old boy. And then this tumor grew and there was no doctor to take him to. So four years later, my son is dying. And I realized that's why we were here. That's why the doctors had given up their vacation time to go to Africa and and operate for free. A couple days later, I watched this amazing eight-hour surgery. And this doctor from California and and from the UK removed Alfred's tumor. And a couple weeks later, I got to take him back home to his village and I got to watch him heal. I got to watch his life completely restored. So this was a place of miracles. I would wake up in the morning, I would photograph the patients scheduled for surgery that day. This woman, Martha Lean, she told me that this tumor grew for eight years and people would stone her. They would throw rocks at her face when they saw her tumor because they thought she was spiritually cursed and she needed a 40-minute surgery just to remove a, a benign mass and get her face and her life back. So it was a powerful year. I took 50,000 photographs that first year. And I'm blasting my club list with these photos. You can imagine my list gets a little smaller, right? (laughs) People are like, that Chanel party was awesome, but I'm not down with the leprosy party, okay? Or like the giant tumors. But, you know, I joke about that. That was actually the edge case. Most people said, how do I help? How do I give money? How do I sponsor a surgery? How do I sponsor a doctor? How do I come on the ship like you? And I realized that the same gift for promoting nightclubs, getting people drunk every night, I could tell a very different story, a redemptive story, a story that might move people to care about others and to give money to to end suffering. So I signed up for a second year in Liberia. I didn't know what was next. And on that second tour, I got into the rural areas and I saw people drinking dirty water for the first time. And I had never seen a human being drink dirty water. You know, I sold water. It was called Voss. It was $10 in in a nightclub to people who wouldn't even open the water after they bought it. And as I traveled through Liberia, I saw people drinking from swamps and from ponds and from rivers. And I learned that 50% of the country didn't have clean water. I met girls like Hawa, who was 13. I realized this is the water she has known to drink, to bathe, to, uh, to cook with. This is all she's ever known her whole life. No wonder people are sick. No wonder things are growing on people's faces. So I I started showing these pictures to the surgeons, and they're like, yeah, we know. We know that dirty water is responsible for 26 diseases. We know that half of the hospital beds in the world are occupied because people don't have clean water to drink. So I thought, man, if, if I really wanted to make an impact on health, maybe this is the issue that I should go after. Maybe trying to bring the world clean water would be more of an impact than you know, funding the next 50 or $60 million hospital ship. So I come back to New York City and this had left just such an impact on me. And I, I come back and I'm, I'm just telling people, I, I think I need to bring clean water to everybody on earth. Like I, I, there was a responsibility to do something about what I'd seen. I, I couldn't live it for two years and then just come back to normal life. So water, you know, most people don't think about this issue. You know, most of you woke up today, you you drank water, maybe you took a shower. 
You know, this is what it's like for the 663 million people. Right now, one out of every 10 people on the planet is drinking bad water. They have never known what you knew today. One out of 10 people. Now, we can numb out when we see these big statistics. But over the, the years, you know, we've gone out and we've met people like John Bosco in Rwanda. This is what it looks like if you don't have water. This is the water that you, you drink. This is the water that you wash your clothes with. This little girl I met in Honduras was just drinking from a river that ran in front of, of her house. And I mentioned there's so many diseases associated with water. You've all heard of cholera. You've heard of trachoma. And I'd never heard of schistosomiasis, which was a fancy word for parasites or worms. You know, right now, 100 million people have worms crawling around in their body because of the water they've had to drink. I met this little girl in eastern Kenya, and she would drink from this bottle, and then she would just vomit on her shirt. And it was from a, a disgusting brown river, the Molo River, and she would drink and throw up, drink and throw up. I remember giving her clean water, taking this bottle away, and I took this back to New York and and put it under a microscope. I gave it to a lab, and, and they sent this back to me. They said, this is what she's drinking. The water you sent us is alive. I know human beings, certainly no child, should be drinking water like this. I learned that one out of every three schools on the planet not only didn't have clean water, also didn't have a toilet. So this was a huge problem for girls. Teenage girls would, would hit puberty. They would stay home four or five days every single month. You're not going to a school if you're a teenage girl without water and without a toilet. And they would fall behind in their studies. They would drop out. And, and as I travel around, I see girls in the middle of the school day walking around with 40 pounds of dirty water strapped to their back. It curves their spines over time. It's water that's not even helpful. Then the last thing I'd say is it's a women's issue. In all of the countries I've traveled, I've now, now been to 69 countries, I have never seen men get water. It is the women that are ankle deep in cow feces or cow urine trying to get to the eye of a spring. It's the women that are digging in the sand, hoping to find water for their families. And these women here told me that they were afraid of crocodile attacks. And they named other women in the village who had come here and had been dragged off. This woman in Niger I was with, her name was Aisa. And she told me she buried eight of her children. Eight children. She names them all. She told me the ages of their death. Then she shows me the water that she was giving all of her kids. So it's a huge, huge problem. Water means health and education and, and, and time wasted for women. The great thing about it is it's also a solvable problem. This is what has been so great about working on this now for a decade. There is not a single person alive right now we don't know how to help. No one. There are diseases we do not know how to cure, but there's not a single person alive that we could not bring clean water to right now. We haven't created the will to do it. We haven't created the movement and the awareness and the money, but we know how to do it. And a lot of different things work. There's no one size fits all solution. There's no silver bullet, but you can dig wells or drill wells or build bio sand filters or rainwater harvesting systems. We've now employed 11 different technologies across the portfolio. It is often as simple as $10,000 drilling an entire well for a village. You know, and you imagine what we would spend $10,000 on, maybe a family vacation, you know, maybe a car. I know some people that spend that on a watch, but an entire village. What, what the community doesn't have access to, to to help themselves is about a million dollars of drilling equipment, the rigs and the compressors and the trucks, or the local hydrologists who know how to find that clean water underneath. But when you can bring that in, it's one of the most amazing things to be there and see clean water shoot out of the ground. I mean, if there's, you know, if this is not a picture of heaven, like unearthing clean, life-saving water, you know, from... And... and you know, every time I'm there, I always watch the kids. They rush the drilling rig. They're, they're splashing. They're looking and tasting clean water for the very first time. You know, we've said now for 10 years, water changes everything. Water is the most powerful substance, most powerful thing on earth. If you want to improve people's lives, taking someone from dirty water to clean water, I argue there's no better way to do it. Water impacts health, right? If your kids aren't drinking from a swamp, if they're not vomiting on themselves from contaminated water, you have healthier children. You have better education. You have, you have, you have kids that get better grades if they can actually go to the school, if they don't have to walk for water to a river in the morning or drop out for a week 
every single month. We hear these amazing stories of women getting all this time back in their day when they're not walking anymore. Often women are walking seven hours a day, seven days a week. Imagine getting 49 hours magically back into every week. And we hear stories of entrepreneurship, of of women starting small businesses. Some women just say we're better mothers. We get to spend more time with our families. I think what I've loved most about this issue is it's, it's one of the very few things that everybody can agree on, right? Nobody wants people to die of bad water, right? Regardless of your religious views, if you do what I do on a Sunday, regardless of your, your political views or your race or your geography, it's one of the most unifying things. You can bring people together and say, you may disagree about many different things, but can we agree to agree on clean water? Right? I mean, the beauty of this job is no one ever tells me to stop this. I mean, no one's like, no, let them die of bad water. Let those women walk 50 hours a week. And you know that you've improved someone's life when you can take them from dirty to clean. So I started this org 12 years ago. I'll take you back to that moment. I come off the mercy ship. I'm 30 years old. I've done two years. I've paid them to do it, so I'm completely broke. And I'm back in New York, and I get the idea for Charity Water, and I'm telling everybody, I want to bring clean water to everybody in the world, but I realize this is not going to be easy because most of my friends don't trust charities. In fact, most people don't trust charities. And I have nowhere to live. I'm crashing on a closet floor in New York City. Somebody took me in and gave me free rent on on an actual closet floor. But I realized that I would need to get people to trust us. I would need to create a new model. To, to bring back some of these disenchanted people. Here are the stats on this. 42% of Americans actually say they don't trust charities. And 70% of Americans more recently polled said they believe charities waste their money. So I thought to do the mission to get people clean water, we would have to do something even bigger. We would have to reinvent or reimagine charity. We'd have to create a completely new construct. And I love the word charity. Charity means love. It means to look after your neighbor in need and, and, and get nothing in return. I thought we need more of this in the world, not less. More people moving towards charity, moving towards love, and not cynical or skeptical about it. So I had a couple big ideas of how we might speak to some of the objections. The first was just to create a way where 100% of all the money we would ever raise would go directly to help people get clean water. And people were like, well, that's a dumb idea. How will you pay for overhead? In the beginning, I had no idea. But I opened up two separate bank accounts and said they will never touch each other. All the public's money will go directly to build water projects that help people get clean water. And somehow, I'm going to raise the overhead from a small group of people who who want to pay for those unsung costs. They want to pay for the staff salaries. So that was pillar number one, 100%. You would always know where every penny, dollar, hundred dollars went. The second thing was we would just prove to people what we did with the money, prove impact. And we'd use technology to do that. Now, the first thing we did was just started putting every water point up on Google Earth, up on Google Maps. We said, we're going to build the most hyper-transparent charity that anyone has ever seen before. We will be accountable to our work, to our results. We will prove what we are doing with these donations. The third pillar was to work with local partners. I believed, you know, Westerners like me didn't need to be running around Africa or India with hard hats on. Okay, for the work to be culturally appropriate, for it to be sustainable, it had to be led by the locals in each of these countries. Ethiopians helping to lead their communities and country forward. The people of Cambodia building the water projects. And I wanted to give away the credit. Our local partners would be the ones planting the flag, not us. They would be the ones being celebrated, not the the foreigners. We could raise awareness, we could raise money, we could build a movement to get people to care. But then the work would be done by the locals. So we put all that together, and I'm embarrassed to say that the best idea I had was to throw a party in a nightclub (laughs) on my 31st birthday. I didn't have any better ideas. I got a club for free. I got open bar, donated for an hour. I lured all my friends there, and I made them all pay $20 on the way in. We had this big plexi box. And that night, we collected $15,000, and we took the $20 times 700 and some people, We took every penny to a refugee camp in northern Uganda where 30,000 people were drinking from a swamp. They were all huddled there. And we wish we could have done more, but we did our first few projects and we sent the photos and the GPS back 
to the 750 people that came to the party and said, you gave $20, here are the people drinking clean water a world away. You did this. And it, I remember people were like, they were blown away, you know, they, they, that their money had done something. We said, this is it. Let's build this virtuous cycle of impact. Let's keep telling people what we did with their money and hope they will continue to give and support. We tried to be creative. We just removed water from a bunch of things, just trying to get people to think differently about water. You know, imagine being a mother and having to give your kid potential death in a baby bottle every day. Well, this is the reality for so many mothers around the world. We got donated space on buses, on taxi tops, on, on TV. I believe that we had compelling, dynamic, creative content. People would want it to be seen. They would want to help us get the word out. We built a digital-only organization. We were the first charity to get a million Twitter followers, first charity to use Instagram. We just believe that this is how the movements of the future they would grow online. They would grow on social. We tried to celebrate the dynamism and the compassion and the, the diversity of our community all around the world, saying, look at what all of these different people are doing to raise awareness and money for clean water. We got to partner with luxury brands. We went to Saks and said, you know, you sell $5,000 handbags, okay? We have some $5,000 water projects. We should totally be working together. And we saw luxury retailers give us their windows in Beverly Hills and New York and Chicago and let us build wells inside luxury stores and raise money across their employees and their awareness. You know, over the last 10 years, we've gotten to work with some of the most amazing brands like Spotify or Twitter or, or Apple or uh, just asking companies to bring their employee base, bring their customers to this issue. You know, fun one once, American Express put us on their homepage for three months. As we, as we grew, we just always look for ways to show people what their money would do. These are all the parts that go into a $10,000 well. So if you gave $10,000, we would go and buy all this in Ethiopia. But if you wanted to fund a water project in Cambodia, $10,000 buys something completely different. It buys all of these parts to bring bio sand filters to the entire community. We just wanted people to see where their money would go and make that connection. As the organization matured, we started putting our wells online, trying to create smart sensors like this one, retrofitting our wells, connecting them to the cloud so we would know the clean water continued to flow for years to come. So that if a well would break, we'd actually know it and local mechanics could go and respond to that. They could go find it. They could look at the data, know that these projects were not just one and done. They weren't lasting for a month or a year, but were lasting for longer than a decade, decades to come. One of the coolest things that we stumbled upon was this idea of asking people to donate their birthdays. And we said, people have birthdays, they don't need any more stuff, right? You don't need a tie or a handbag or a wallet. Let's donate our birthdays so people can have clean water. And we saw this movement spring up. Seven-year-old kid named Max in Texas starts knocking on doors asking for $7 donations. Okay, he raises $22,000. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, okay? He lived in a very nice neighborhood. These were big houses, okay? <laughs> this idea spreads through, through sports. Tony Hawk donates his birthday. Jack Dorsey, who created Twitter and Square, donated three birthdays. It goes to Hollywood. Will and Jada Smith donate their birthdays. They raise over $200,000. Then they say, we want to come with you and actually see the impact that our birthdays and our fans have made. So this was cool working with tech CEOs and people in Hollywood, but the, the heart of the movement was six-year-olds like Lori in New York City raising a little bit of money, or 16-year-olds in the, the middle of the country like Maggie. One of my favorites, 89-year-old, Nona Ween. Yeah, her mission statement is beautiful. She says, I'm turning 89. I just want that to be possible for more people. You know, she has lived twice as long as the average life expectancy in so many of these countries. So if her birthday could help people have more birthdays, that's how she wanted to celebrate her 89th. The movement grew. People started climbing mountains, trying to raise a dollar a foot. We've had people skydive for charity water. We've had them uh, build, make sails and sail across the Atlantic. This guy took the $10,000 he saved for an engagement ring, bought a well instead back in India, proposed to his wife that way. This guy in Atlanta listened to Nickelback for 168 consecutive hours, okay? People felt so sorry for Jesse, they gave him 30-some thousand dollars. Cosette is four. She sold over $5,000 of paintings for Charity Water. Maddie up in Vancouver did 12 lemonade stands. At her last lemonade stand, she got a local band to perform on the sidewalk. 
so that she could attract buyers. She's now over $5,600 of sales. So what we realized was this wasn't our story. This wasn't my story. This was the, this amazing, much bigger story of so many everyday people bringing the best of themselves, their birthdays, their, their money, their volunteer hours, their lemonade to make the world a better place to see people get this most basic need, to see them get clean water. And we said, we just need to take a back seat. We need to stay out of the way and celebrate these people. Just keep inviting people in. Over the last 12 years, from idea to, to where we are now, over a million people have made charity water, have made clean water a part of their story. And they've given over $375 million. <clears throat> That's enough money to get 10 million human beings clean water. 10 million people from dirty water to clean water now across 27 countries. Today, Charity Water employs over 1,500 locals every single day who wake up and take this money and they, they make their communities and their countries better. They move them forward using clean water. So I look back, you know, I, I spent a couple years just trying to, to write a lot of this down. I, I, I wrote my first book. It was a terrible experience. I don't think I ever want to do it again. <laughs> I put it out there, and, and at the last minute, my wife and I decided, hey, we're just going to give away the advance and all the proceeds. We want this thing just to help people. I called it thirst, you know, the literal thirst of so many people around the world. And, and really, I wanted to, to share my search for purpose. You know, I was looking for it in all the wrong places for 10 years. And we put this out there, and uh, it was an amazing experience. I think sometimes when you give things away, amazing things can happen. On launch day, I remember waking up, turning on Twitter, and seeing Bill Gates telling over 40 million people to go buy this book. <laughs> and then our former mayor in New York, Michael Bloomberg, and Richard Branson, and Aria Huff, all these amazing entrepreneurs. The book wound up debuting on the New York Times bestseller list and, and, and just reaching places that I never thought it could reach. As we... Look ahead, you know, we reflect a minute on 10 million people. You know, it's a lot of people. I'm always saying it's never enough. We haven't done enough. You know, I, I, my wife is always trying to get me to celebrate a little more of, of just how big this is. It is actually more than the combined population of Wyoming, Montana, Utah, and Oregon. <laughs> so it's, I, I think I got all the locations. It would fill up the stadium in Salt Lake over 540 times. So it's a lot of stadiums full of people, right? OK. Great, that's the good. See, I'm already moving on. You put it against 663 million people that still need our help, 166th of the problem, 1.5%. So we better be at the very beginning of this journey. I, I believe the best is yet to come. And that's why, you know, I take 80 flights a year. I, I, I'm constantly out there just trying to advocate on behalf of the people who, who don't have a voice, who can't share their struggles, their needs with you and continue to invite people to be a part of the story. So if you're asking how you might help, a bunch of ways that people engage with us might be a couple people that could actually help an entire community. Every once in a while, we'll have uh, a family say, I can do an entire well, or my small business can do an entire well. We can bring a rig in. We can make clean water happen for 300 people. We have another way to help, which is this amazing community we started growing. Levi and I were talking about this earlier. It's kind of like Netflix or Spotify for clean water. We said, look, the average person now subscribes to 10 different things. Okay? What if we could create a subscription where 100% of the value was passed on to people who needed clean water? Right? Where we don't get movies or content or music, but 100% of that money goes. And I wasn't sure that this was going to work. We called it the spring, you know, a time of, of new beginnings, a time of hope, and, and literally where so much clean water around the world comes from. And we said, we'll give 100% of whatever people show up and give every month, and we'll, we'll send that to the field. We'll tell stories of impact. We'll show people where there's money is going and the lives that it's touching. And this started to work. It started spreading. Now we have spring members in over 110 countries around the world. We have spring members in Africa. We have people in India. We have people in Southeast Asia. We have spring members in the countries where we work showing up. So it's a simple way to, to get involved. We created just a, a, a very simple landing page where the Fresh Life Church community could learn more um, about this and engage, and we could even track your impact. Maybe there are people that could do you know, one Spotify a month. We have people call us and say, we canceled HBO to actually give people clean water. 
You know, wrapping up, I just kind of have, um, I want to just end on John Bosco's story because this is what it's all about for us. When people reject the apathy that is so easy to embrace with a paralyzing global issue like this and say, I can do something. We're able to go into communities and take kids like this drinking the most disgusting water, take mothers and children who should not be drinking water like this. And drilling rigs can head towards their village and pull off the paved roads into the rural areas and local Rwandans can jump out. And in less than six days, the same child drinking from the swamp is drinking clean water less than a week later. And what's cool is we've been able to go back and visit people later. Uh, You know, John Bosco, the first time we met him, he was a 13-year-old. We went back eight years later and we found that he was all grown up. And in that time, he had gotten married and he had his own daughter. And we realized that the cycle of poverty was broken for this family, for this community, for this village. And that's what we get to do. Two final thoughts to leave you with. You know, the first is I I am such a believer that God can redeem anyone and anything. You know, this is what I deeply believe. I mean, I hope that I am living proof of this. If you had met me 14 years ago, you do not invite this guy to church, okay? I don't think I even get, maybe I get invited to sit in the back, but certainly not to share. I was full of self-loathing, of rage, of, of, of consuming, of, of vice. And when I turned the page, when I decided to follow God and, and put all that aside, when I decided to try and obey, I, I've been blessed with a life of purpose. I've been blessed with an amazing family, an amazing wife, and two children, and, and I get to do this every day. I get to talk about compassion and empathy and, and bring clean water. We now help 4,500 people get water every single day. Some of you might feel like your past might define you. You know, I, if I had felt like, I mean, I did feel like that. But God loves to redeem things. My favorite verse is, is this verse in Joel. It says, yeah, God can restore the years that the locusts have eaten. And then he lists a bunch of nasty worms and caterpillars that I'd never heard of. You know, I Googled locust hoard. This is the picture that I got. Right? You get this sense of, of something so barren that no, there's no hope for any growth. Nothing could ever grow there again. And the next verse, God says, you'll have plenty to eat until you're full and you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you. That's how I feel. I feel like God has worked wonders in my life. I know he's worked wonders in your life. And I know that some of you might just feel like, ah, oh, I've got so much shame that the things that I've done, they, they are keeping me from a new future. I, I would just tell you, I mean, you, unless you've killed someone, you weren't as bad as I was. I mean, it would be, you'd be hard-pressed to find a more degenerate. But I was able to turn around. I was able to start over and live a completely different life. God has worked wonders for me. Thank you so much for letting me share my story.